Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, At the Gardenscape Presents, The Holistic Nature of Us. I intend to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature is in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound interchange, so our natural world is valued once again. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Ellen Moyer, Ph.D., whose mission is to help restore the environment and promote a healthier way for us to inhabit this earth. She is the author of numerous publications, including Our Earth, Our Species, Ourselves, How to Thrive with Creating a Sustainable World. This book and Ellen's experiences are the subject of today's podcast. Hi, Ellen. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Hi, Ju. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, Let's start right off with your book. I'm fascinated with the title. It ties into the concepts of holistic uh, nature that we all are, including the earth. So let me ask you this. What inspired you to write this book? Well, everything changed for me uh, about a dozen years ago when a number of large wood-burning electrical power plants were proposed in western Massachusetts. I'm an environmental engineer and I had been working away at uh, helping to clean up hazardous waste sites and kind of quietly nicking away at them for several decades working for consulting firms thinking, well, uh, things are getting better, not fast enough, but I think we're going to be okay. That was where I was coming. But uh, when these wood-burning power plants were proposed, I came to the realization that we are completely off track and uh, we are destroying our life support system and don't even realize it. So uh, the the problem is these wood-burning power plants would devastate forests, uh, kill wildlife, uh, send children to the emergency room with more asthma attacks, air pollution, uh, rip off rate payers, uh, devastate pretty much everything, water, air, soil, trees, plants, animals, humans, pretty much you name it. Uh, But regulatory agencies were green lighting the projects, even environmental protection type uh, regulatory agencies such as the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So I thought, what on earth is going on here that uh, Hmm. these devastating threats would be out there and nobody's doing anything? So citizens had to protect ourselves on our own. Uh, with the help of several environmental nonprofit organizations, and we killed these projects. It took about seven years of very hard work, uh, but we killed them. So the two main things I learned from all this were that, A, uh, we are off the rails with our lifestyle, a suicidal trajectory, and, B, that citizens have the power to, to put a stop to this ridiculous behavior and uh, change things. So once I came to those realizations, I thought, you know, we can't, we don't have the energy to fight all these little projects, onesie, twosie type things um, that come up. We need like a, to overhaul our approach <laughs> to life. And so I wrote this book to inspire people to um drastically change how we do things so that we can live sustainably and have better health and greater happiness and greater wealth. Well, that that sounds um, like a very noble order, but we all know that we are seduced into certain lifestyle patterns, and it seems like we're not accomplishing a whole lot. 
Do you do you agree with that? I mean, I sense an urgency in your message. I've heard an urgency in others. Uh, we're kind of at a tipping point for the misuse of resources. How do you how do you address that? Yeah, we have all the tools we need, uh, and a lot of good things are happening, but we need to pick up the pace and the intensity. Uh, I think just from this year, learning how much more advanced uh, climate change impacts are than we had thought before is a real wake-up call that, wow, uh, we need to do a lot more. Uh, so, yeah, it's very dire, um, but we have what it takes to create the kind of world we want. So if that's your message, then um, I usually ask my guests for a couple of practical tips when we end the show, but I think it's important or, or appropriate here to ask you for some practical tips. With your sense of urgency, what could I and others do today that would make a difference? Yeah, and several chapters of my book go into that in a lot of detail, actually. Um, there's uh, one chapter that includes 55 things you and I can do uh, immediately that help ourselves and our world at the same time. And by the way, people can get that. They can download that for free on my website. Uh, so we need to do a number of things individually and we also need to change our institutions and policies so that the rules of the game aren't rigged to encourage bad behavior uh, such as wood-burning power plants uh, and discourage uh, good behavior. Um, and, and my book is really a, a cleanup plan. That's what I do. I, I come up with cleanup plans for hazardous waste sites. And the, the, the actions have to be doable, practical, cost-effective, realistic. And so I apply that, that kind of approach to the whole world in my book. And just to mention a couple of things from uh, the chapter on what people can do individually, so I'll mention a few things that might surprise people. Uh, I think people know a lot of things like turning off lights and all that kind of thing. Well, one thing people may not realize is that uh, what you decide to have for dinner tonight makes a difference in the planet. And you can start making a difference immediately by choosing organically grown uh, food, which will help both you and the climate because organic methods release way fewer greenhouse gases than quote-unquote conventional methods, and it also uh, reduces the toxic chemicals in our air, water, soil. It lets monarch butterflies and frogs and other species live instead of die. And these small uh, things that we do a couple times a day, day after day after day, add up to real impacts over our lifetime. So that would be uh, number one, to eat organically grown food rather than food grown with pesticides. Uh, another one in the food category is to eat less meat. Um, meat production is arguably the most damaging industry on the planet because of the vast environmental impacts. And if we can just cut back, uh, that's going to help climate, air, water, soil, and also our health at the same time. And a, a third one in the food category is to waste less food. In our country, we waste 40% of all the food that's produced. It's incredible. Wow, that's and, a high number. Yeah, and this occurs from farm field to table, so I'm not saying it's all... <laughs> you know, by um, individual consumers. It's all down the whole chain. Mm -hmm. But consumers have a big role to play, and all that food comes at an environmental cost to produce. So if we can waste less, uh, we're going to lessen our footprint, and we're going to save about $150 per month per family. So it's good for our uh, economy. Well, I find that in the past, whenever something hits our pocketbook, we tend to take action. So that's a very good point um, for 
looking at our actions, looking, understanding the consequences of our actions, just with these three examples that you gave us, we can all apply that in our daily life in, yeah. in, in some fashion. Here's another one, uh, and uh, you know we can't go through all, all, all right. the dozens of them, but here's one that people can do uh, to cut down on junk mail. You know, we get a lot of junk mail, and we can call those catalog companies and tell them to discontinue sending us the catalogs. Every time I get junk mail I don't want, I I either send the info back in the, in a return envelope if they give one and say, take me off your list and don't share my info with anybody else. And if there isn't one, which is more and more common these days, I call the 800 number and say, take me off your list. So I just keep on top of it. You know, every few days I have to make a call, uh, but I just do it. And I'm just delighted when there's nothing in my mailbox. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That's true, and then then we have a time waster because we get the emails from these companies now on the Internet. So I know I've been doing a lot of deleting and unsubscribing because it really does clutter up my time. And yeah. so we have that kind of issue to face as we get more and more dependent on our you know Internet resources. Um, yes. And could I mention just one overarching thing? Sure. Um, you know, you, are, you and I are the ultimate human superpower because we vote and we buy things. And the things that you and I buy just in our day-to-day -day lives make up two-thirds of the U.S. economy. And it is accurate to say that people do what we pay them to do. So a lot of this is unconscious on our part. If we can become more conscious and, and buy things that we agree with and are aligned with and that are consistent with our values, we uh, move the needle because mm -hmm. we create demand. If people want, uh, say, grass-fed beef instead of this horrifically produced uh, uh, confined animal beef, uh, producers, producers will switch to grass-fed methods. Now, I'm not promoting meat. As you know, I just said, let's eat me less meat. Uh, but we really make a difference with how we um, spend our money. So if we do that consciously, we can make a difference. I don't think you can stress that enough. I taught for many years at WestCon, and I would say to my students over and over and over again, everything we buy counts. Exactly. Everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We are casting a vote with what exactly. we purchase. You know. Um, so if we really don't like the fast food industry, for example, there's a lot of negative uh, feeling about that industry. Um, you know, don't shop there. Yeah, I never do. I use the bathrooms. <laughs> That's about it. Right, right. So in terms of your wonderful suggestions, that kind of segues into sustainability. My understanding of sustainability is, is we want something that generates growth for future generations. It's not just sustainable for our generation. It has to be sustainable for future generations. Um, could you tell me more about that in the focus of your book and sustainability? Yeah, and there's, I know it's uh, a term that confuses people, but to me it's extremely simple. It just means uh, we use resources uh, so that future generations will have those resources. So we, we use them, but we don't use them up. And we also don't drive other species to extinction. Um, I'm very uh, egalitarian when it comes to different species, and I care about other species about as much as I care about the human species. So that's all it really means. And when you think back to all the sacrifices our ancestors made in order for you and me to be here today, we have lost that ethic, I believe, in caring about the future generations uh, the same way so that we, you know, set the stage for them to thrive later on. I mean, look at what we're doing. We're, we're sticking future generations with this huge um, bill with the new tax uh, plan in, uh, in our country. Uh, we're 
putting greenhouse gases out there that are going to make things miserable for future generations. We've lost a third of our topsoil in the last since 1975. You know, we're really um, creating a, a bad deal for future generations, and we really need to uh, reverse that trend. What's so interesting to me, Doug Tallamy in his book, Bringing Nature Home, reminds me of just what you said. We've lost one-third of the topsoil on the planet uh, in the last hundred years. Um, however, if we would take action today to grow better soil, we could change the whole picture in ten short years. Yeah, yeah it's very re reversible. Nature is so forgiving, you know. When we stop our damaging behavior, uh, ecosystems tend to self-heal. It's 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 such a bargain. Uh, so we don't, you know, it's much easier to fix our situation than we often think because of things like that. But that's the piece that I I feel um, I'd like to drive home to our listeners, but also to be a voice for the fact that nature is forgiving. Um, there's checks and balances in nature all the time. If we just allow nature to go back to its own devices, and uh, we see great uh, regrowth and regeneration, and our wonderful YouTube has videos from all over the world where they're making tremendous progress in desert arid, arid lands, uh, creating fertile soil in a very short period of time by taking some very practical, sustainable practices with farming. Um, so that's the shift we need on a grander scale, I think, with yeah. the, the way our monocrop, you know, agriculture is designed. So you have a chapter in your book um, about the fact that we do need a huge, huge shift to, to really make a difference today. Um, and you remind us over and over again that we're not separate from nature. And in some ways, we've, we've been blinded to our interconnectedness. And we've often thought we are superior to nature, but actually we're just one of many species that's an integral part of nature. Um, yeah, we, we have a little attitude problem. <laughs> I, I think so. I think it's a big attitude problem. Yeah, and an arrogance problem and a, and a violence problem. You know, everything is oppositional. We, everything is uh, this against that. I mean, mm -hmm. Environment against economy, even growing our food, we turn it into a chemical warfare situation. Uh, right. So it's so damaging, and a lot of it comes out of like the old style of physics, Newtonian physics, where things are little separate, like billiard balls, right? They're completely separate, and one hits another, and it goes off in a direction. And we're, we have not... It, incorporated uh, quantum physics and the new science that says, hey, everything is connected. And when you think about it, uh, we feel, each of us, as if we are this separate, self-contained entity apart from the environment. But it is so untrue if you consider that uh, with every breath of air that you take, the environment is coming into your body. With every bite of food, the environment's coming into your body. With every sip of water, you know, uh, the only way you can, you can't even stop it if you die because all these worms are coming in. You know? So uh, there is no getting around it that we are completely uh, integrated with everything else and uh, you cannot cut yourself off. From it, but we have these mental constructs that that make us uh, believe uh, delusionally uh, that we are separate, and we really are not. No, we're not. And in your chapter two, you again say, and this is a quote from the book: "Human health utterly depends on environmental health," and that's the piece I do not feel our medical system has really understood at this point in time. You know, I've had a, a lot of experiences in my nursing career where I saw some of our treatments, um, the whole purpose behind them is is to block, to inhibit, and I don't think nature works that way, and I don't think our biology works that way. We have this inherent 
ability to heal. Uh, and just like you said, nature is so forgiving, I think our bodies are very forgiving when you think about what we put our physical bodies for and from a lack of respect for it in some ways. We just kind of take this physical body for granted. That is so true. And uh, one thing we don't appreciate is that uh, we are more of an ecosystem than one body because we have ten times as many bacterial cells as human cells within us, and we have something like a hundred or a thousand times as much bacterial DNA as human DNA. So we that's another way in which uh, this uh, delusion that we're cut off and separate is just so wrong. <laughs> well, it is wrong, but it yeah. takes education to change that kind of a model. Um, my Native American ancestors would often say to me, the elders, they would say, you know, it takes seven generations, so everything we do right in this now, thought, word, and deed, impacts the next seven generations. And if we all took that a little more seriously, I think the world would be a better place. Yeah, and there, it's sad that we don't really, because we, we have a, like a, a poverty mentality, right? Because we think there's not enough to go around, so we, we, we don't have enough to leave some for the seven generations to follow us. We've got to hoard what we can right now before somebody else grabs it. And it's just such a small-minded and pathetic uh, way to live the beautiful life that we have. Well, I agree with you. Um, it does make me sad when I see you know, species decline. Uh, it makes me sad when I see development just walk away and leave um, a land space uh, just to sit dormant. Maybe that's a good thing in the long run. But I see erosion. I see um, species losing habitat. Uh, and I also see the water being contaminated. So, again, it's, it's a mindset of teaching our children uh, to create um, something more sustainable. Do you have any experience with uh, school systems or young children in any way? Or are you hoping your book will be used by teachers to impart some of your wonderful knowledge to the younger generation? Well, actually, I used to be an outdoor education counselor at a camp, and uh, I, I loved to uh, teach uh, young kids about plants and animals and constellations and things like that and I saw what a difference it made to them mm -hmm. so I'm a big proponent of getting kids outside and, and getting their hands dirty like growing food and, and learning where their food comes from and the miracles of nature and, and uh, so I'm hoping that my book will rub off on uh, parents and uh, Young people have been reading my book. I don't think it's good for elementary school level. It's, uh, but, um, yeah, we, we need that. And the tragic thing here is that um, in, in keeping with this idea that the environment and our health go together, the tragic thing is that our approach is not only destroying plants, animals, and our life support system, but our health. You know, we are in an epidemic of chronic disease that is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes the bubonic plague uh, look like small potatoes. Um, half of American adults are suffering from at least one chronic disease. And this is uh, things like cancer, heart disease, dementia. Um, you know, all these chronic diseases are a result of our lifestyle. And... Uh, there's so much depression and a lot of uh, cognitive issues out there, ADHD, kids on Ritalin. Uh, it, it's really a very sad thing. So it's not like we are benefiting from our approach uh, that hurts the planet. When we hurt, when we hurt the environment, we hurt ourselves directly. And uh, we're starting to see that more. More and more doctors are. Um, going rogue and uh, uh, dealing with toxins and nutrition, even though they, most medic medical schools don't uh, teach those subjects. 
Uh, but it's just undeniable, and uh, the, the tide is turning on these things. It's more like a race. Uh, will we change fast enough uh, to save our butts here? <laughs> That's it's true. Point. Yeah, there's all there's different publications coming out on that very topic. Uh, will we have enough time to change things around? I have great hope, and and I, I think the Earth is going to be fine. I just don't know if the oh, human yeah. species is going to be fine in the long run. Uh, yeah, with yeah. Some Earth of the things we've done. Yeah, Earth will be fine. Uh, the thing that it's just tragic that we're doing ourselves in like this and then taking other species down with us and we're just creating all this totally optional uh, pain and suffering so we don't have to we can have a much better time and and not just in the future but in the process of turning our situation around we can have a fun and fulfilling time. I mean, that, that example of eating healthy food, you know, when you eat good food, you feel a lot better. <laughs> have more energy and ha you don't have brain fog. Yeah, and you just feel happier. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, everybody, everybody wins there. Mm -hmm. That's so, so true. As I say in my book, you know, we have everything we need. The one thing that's running a little short is time. So we need to really get ourselves in gear here. Mm. I agree with you, which is um, one of the main purposes of getting this podcast out, to, to get folks like yourself here to stress the message and connect the dots and get people really thinking that what we've done to nature, we do to ourselves. What we do to ourselves, we do to nature. And again, my elders would say to me, you know, the rivers are no different than the veins in our body in our uh, the blood flow, you know, and some of our chronic diseases uh, have uh, uh, an origin in having um, unhealthy substances in our blood just because of the way we eat and the pollution. And mm -hmm. so if we look at the rivers, we can see what's happening within ourself uh, if we wanted to work that symbolically and connect the dots between our interconnectedness uh, between the rivers in our bodies. A biological function, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so today um, I'd like to end with uh, having you tell our folks about your book again, where it's available, and anything else about your work that you'd like to share. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Uh, my website is really the best place to go for everything, and my website is Ellen Moyer PhD. Dot com and I'll just spell that because there are a lot of ways to spell Moyer. Um, e l l e n m o y e r p h d dot com, and there's a page there on my books, and right at the top is uh, my latest one: Our Earth, Our Species, Ourselves: How to Thrive While Creating a Sustainable World. And you'll see a little video, a quick. Uh, intro to it and there's a link to uh, Amazon and uh, the wonderful customer reviews I've been getting. People are saying things like, this is the first book I've ever Im immediately reread and uh, things like that. So I'm so happy. Oh. Well, oh, congratulations. Well. It's timely oh. and we need voices like yours to speak um, to speak loudly and clearly. And again, what I like about your book is that it's understandable um, it's science based but it's understandable for practical living and that's what we need today how can I take one thing from your book and apply it in my daily life because I that will make a difference how can you um, well yeah you could turn to any page and there'd probably be something there that you could you could uh, use right. uh, if I could just mention a couple other things people will find on my website sure um, uh, I blog on the Huffington Post, and so you can uh, see a page there with all my 25 or so articles on Huffington Post, and they're all about environmental and sustainability type issues. And also, if people want to make a difference, an easy way to do that is to sign environmental petitions. They often make a huge difference, and I have a petition signing site there that people can subscribe to. It's free. And uh, we um, consolidate all these petitions and make it super quick and easy for people to sign them. And you just feel great afterwards because you you can uh, weigh in on, you know, about 10 things a week and, and move the needle there. So 
Um, I would love it if people would check it out. And you can get a free chapter, uh, the one I mentioned before, of 55 Things You Can Do to Help Yourself and the World. Uh, you can download, download that for free on my website. You'll see it right on the home page there. So. Well, thank you, Ellen. That's um, that's exciting, and I do hope our listeners take advantage of your free 55 things to do, but also uh, I think it's very important for us to sign petitions. I know I do that myself because um, I do believe our voice does count and it will make a difference in the long run. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, examples that I've made a list of where it made a difference. It, it's amazing. Cool. So the, again, that's uh, www.ellenmoyerphd.com. Please check out her website and get back to her. So thank you, everyone, and thank you, Ellen, uh, for joining this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. Um, we're seeking to inspire all of us to join with nature in creating solutions. I hope all of you feel as inspired as I do by Ellen's book, her talk, and her very practical advice. So this is Judith Dreyer, the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website. Go to www.judithdreyer.com or you can visit Amazon, Nook, Kobe, and Indigo as well as Ingram Distribution. Visit my website to order the book for a replay of this podcast and print transcript all posted on my blog. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thanks for having me, Judith.